this particular presentation, or any, any part of this particular presentation. This is going on the fourth year. Uh, first year, I guess, was a little too long and, and uh, really a little too historical. Uh, I forgot the second year. And the third year, I gave most of my time to Glenn. So this time, I, it's still, I feel, in a way, a little too long. But, uh, and the reason I'm saying it's the, it's the last time I'll do it this way, because I think part of the introduction uh, that we give to you here is for you to better know, I think, what we're about. And uh, I think tonight we'll run this on video. So therefore, I think in, in following years, uh, students who want to know about uh, the faculty can follow part of it on, on video. And then hopefully, the kinds of discussions that will take place will be more philosophical. And, and we'll be dealing with issues and new issues rather than, say, historical or old issues, at least for some of us. Uh, I'm going to, the presentation tonight is going to be really in about four parts. Uh, part of it is that I go back, and I, I'm supposed to be younger this year anyway. <laughs> I, I, I've been in, in private practice for about 22 years. Uh, I started my own practice about two years after I uh, got out of college and I became licensed then. I immediately went into my own practice, and most of my whole career has been in, in that kind of practice. The first uh, 16 years I practiced alone, and in most cases that was pretty much alone. I, I most had four draftsmen, and I, most of the time I was working with one, sometimes two. So most of that work, which is primarily in the housing area, uh, houses and housing, is, is personal. Uh, about the last six years, I, when I became involved with education, I also became involved with the partnership. And uh, the way I'm going to start out tonight will be first to present the work of the partnership. And, and then I'll go back through some of the historical stuff that I did, the early work. And then the prime part will be in the third part, where I'll be dealing with a set of issues that many of you have seen and many of you have been uh, involved with, but the ones that I've been most concerned with over a period of about eight or nine years, 10 years. And then uh, finish out with some images and attitudes that I have about what I plan to do in the next, particularly this year, and possibly in some future time. Uh, so let me start first with uh, then the work of the partnership, how it really came about. After being in practice about 16 years, uh, I became involved with uh, issues, well, it was actually sooner than that. After about 10 years of practice, I became involved with urban design issues in the city. And at that time, um, Herb Kahn, Rex Lotary, and I were involved with the AIA Urban Design Committee. And we each had our own practices. Herb had a partnership in the Valley with Ed Farrell. Uh, Rex Lotary practiced alone about the same amount of time I had practiced. and. Uh, each of us, though, were trying to expand our, our points of view and particularly be involved with social issues, land issues, uh, housing issues, uh, whatever there was to, you know, to be involved with in terms of planning and, and, and those kinds of concerns. And what happened through this period was we, after working together, I think, mm, I guess it was about six years, that was sort of weekends, after hours, nights, we got to like each other and uh, found that working on planning problems particularly, uh, we enjoyed doing those together. And we then formed, formed the partnership. So in the first part, then, I will sort of quickly run through the kind of work we do, just so you have some feeling of, of the, the scope of the firm and the scope of issues that uh, I'm involved with in some form. Now, in a partnership and in an office that is not large either. I mean, our office now varies from anywhere from 8 to 15. It's probably at its largest right now. Uh, we, we deal with a, a, a group of issues. But at the same time, uh, this is the kind of work that would be fall under the, what we categorize as team design. This is the uh, work where uh, not one principal takes a single job. But in most cases, there's a lot of discussion that goes on. There's a lot of interchange a certain amount of compromise. And it's a completely different kind of a, a uh, type of work than, say, the second group of work that I'll show you, which is much more personal. And that's uh, mostly at the housing and house scale, 
in which uh, one can deal more readily and more closely sometimes with a client. And I think there, the team gets in the way, and you can't really deal with those issues too well at a team level. Teamwork, as you all know, and most of you have tried to work in teams periodically, and I found through times I've been involved with education, usually teams start and teams break, and teams sometimes come back together again. But it's a, it's a much more difficult way to work, particularly when you're dealing with design. If you're dealing with planning issues, it's pretty good. In fact, it's, it's very, very good. In design, it can be good, too, if there's a common goal and you can strengthen each other. But in many cases, you have similar goals, but you have similar different attitudes about those, those goals. One, one, one partner may be more socially oriented. Another may want to uh, be more dynamic in the design solutions. One may not give a damn about one set of issues, and one may care more about another. And over the period of time, you find that you really take sides, in a sense. And, uh, and so you get into that sort of compromised position, I think, in, in terms of what comes out. And every so often, you get a, a, a project that does work out, I think, better. But quite often, it, it's more difficult to, to deal with. So let's, let's hit the slides, and we'll, we'll go from there. Can I have the lights? Uh, let me move this one back and out. Oh, wait. I'll, I'll leave it up. OK. We'll start on this right-hand side. And this is talking about these were, the, these were the reports and the kinds of studies that we were involved with with the AIA. Uh, in most cases, and in one case with the Goals Council and, and the Goals Committee of the city, uh, from about 1963 to about 1969. Uh, the, the group came together uh, first to do uh, a hillside development study uh, for the, the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, at that time, I think Herb and Ed Farrell and Rex uh, and I were concerned about the issue that the, most of the hills were being cut up in, in the typical padding that, that was going on at, at, that you've seen. And uh, we wrote a, a set of, we, we showed a prototype of the way hills could be used, and that isn't it on the left, but we'll come to that later. But it was dealing with it, because it would be apropos to this at a later date. But we were opposed to that kind of development. We were looking for cluster development and more concentrated development. That was one study. Uh, then at that time, in around, I think, uh, uh, 64, 65, there was the, the first rapid transit uh, corridor study. And uh, this was coming up for, the vo for a vote. And a group of us in the AIA uh, did a study of that, uh, wrote a report on how we felt about it, and uh, then went about questioning the architects and the groups that were involved with that. And it, uh, it was later voted down anyway, and, but it was an interesting uh, involvement with the transportation uh, schemes at the, of those days. OK, then we went into the gray area study area, which I think, if you remember, Bill Simonian gave a um, little bit of background on that. Uh, and then I was, we were all invo involved with the goals committee, uh, developing goals for the city of Los Angeles, and then I headed the housing uh, portion of the summary report of the Los Angeles goals. Uh, this is, well, I knew I didn't, couldn't read that. But anyway, this is uh, uh, part of the gray area study. This was taking the North Broadway area. Those of you who have just gone downtown who have been in my Friday morning class, uh, I have been able to see this area. This is the, the f this really should be reversed, but the freeway, um, the, the, the uh, Santa Ana freeway, no, the uh, San Bernardino freeway, the Hollywood freeway is on the upper part of, of the, the scheme here. Let me turn this on. There, Civic Center is here, and the Civic Development is there. Uh, here's Union Station. This is Alvera Street, uh, Chinatown and some of the other developments. This was a scheme to take that whole railroad area and turn it back into kind of a, an interim use. And that would be a, a walk park type of scheme that, that could be developed for the city of LA, picking up some of the node points while it was in transition. And it's interesting that at this point in time in our office, uh, we're back into a study of, of the movement of the people in downtown LA. And one of the prime areas, again, becomes these railroad tracks and whether the tracks will stay uh, within this area as we get into our own development. So uh, it's been very interesting through the years that the developments and some of the studies we were into are now coming back to us to study really through the office. 
this was some thoughts on uh, what to do with the LA River Basin, and that's taking the downtown area, damming it up, uh, using it uh, in a way that could be used for boats and for um, uh, joyous type use, on, uh, particularly during the, the, the summer months. And uh, this was a proposal that actually Councilman Snyder took to the council, uh, but there were many reasons that the Corps of Engineers and other people had that this could not be done. I, that's still, I think, a uh, fallacy, but that's where it is. Uh, this was another study in the gray areas that took a typical strip commercial and developed, showed a way of developing the four corners, bridging across, and trying to develop a, uh, a, a tighter con concentration and uh, a, a stronger neighborhood <coughs> shopping center. Uh, here again, we're back to the transportation study. This was a scheme that Herb Kahn and I had developed, which said, let's use the freeway corridors. Let's make those the prime uh, use areas. Let's, do, let's take the automobile out of the city core, uh, use it in a way that you would lease it and move from the city in, a, in another transportation route, but within the metropolitan area, uh, develop a smaller vehicle, preferably electric vehicle, that would be computer run and attached. And, and along with that, we developed certain nodes and, and areas that uh, could be used for uh, strengthening up of the centers and the center's concept that later went on uh, to uh, be used by the city uh, planning department. Now the interesting part is we're sort of back here again, not in quite the same way. We at that time had recommended uh, the use of buses on the corridors as a first run to uh, see whether, whether it would really work, then developing, gradually phasing out the automobile in this area and trying to get back into a smaller vehicle that could then run through the, the areas. Now, it looks like one of the prime uh, potential for the city of Los Angeles will be this bus run in its special quarter, the one that now we, we have an example now from San Bernardino and El Monte, uh, on San Bernardino Freeway from El Monte running into LA, and that has a good possibility of becoming uh, the first phase of, of a transit uh, use for this city. Uh, in the next two Friday mornings, not this one, but the week after this, and then the week after Thanksgiving, uh, Rex Lotary and Herb Kahn will be coming in to talk in the morning, so any of you who are interested in what is happening with, one, the political processes and planning, and two, what is happening with our study in the downtown area should attend that particular morning session. I won't go into it here. Okay, now let's move to some of the work then once we got together. Is that off, Jerry? Can I have that on? Okay, now these again won't be in, in necessarily in order, but it give you some idea of the scope of the work that we have in the office. Um, this is showing a, a new town scheme that we developed. It was a very small new town out in the Valencia, near Valencia it's, uh, itself. There was a large piece of ground out there owned by the Whitaker Corporation, and they wanted to study on what to do with that land. Uh, so we had made this proposal for this small a uh, new town in that area that would then interrelate this way with the total community. Our piece, our property is here. These are uh, uh, outlying areas around the area. If there's Valencia, this would be New Hall, uh, Solomon, and so forth. And this was sort of at a center point. We figured there would be some movement through this on the way to some of these others, and we were going to develop uh, conceptually something that would work about like this, and you'll see it better as I move into it. Uh, the model of the scheme was like so. The majority of the land was left uh, un not built upon. We used really some of the principles of our own land use uh, planning that we had done back in 63 and developed a rather concentrated type of development uh, of high density housing here, a small commercial center here, uh, some lower density housing here, again some other high density that would tie in, and then over here was the research center and, and industrial uh, portion of the, to be used by Whitaker, and actually there's a railroad track that comes in here, and that's why that was pulled down to this end of the line, uh, transportation net that ran through the thing in that, in that direction. Again, we, we dammed up a, a portion uh, for water reservoir. Uh, we tried to maintain this valley that, that runs through this portion where most of the green was, was existing. Most of these hills, if you know that area, are pretty barren hills. And so this kind of development tucked in would uh, be, for, we thought, fairly reasonable at that time. What did I do? Let me come back one. Wait. 
Okay, there I'm there. I want to come back on this one. Okay. Uh, another shot of the model in the more concentrated housing level, uh, cross section through the area showing some of the housing down to town center, uh, bridging across and back into this other part of the housing. God. Oh, wait. Okay. It's getting bad. Okay, now. I showed you kind of the finish scheme before I show you really some of the processes that went into it. And I'm only going to show you a portion of these processes. Any, if anybody's really interesting in in, interested in following one of these studies through, uh, I'd be happy to go through it more thoroughly. I'm not intending to uh, try to do that tonight. I'm just showing you some of the things that architecture and architects and planning firms do uh, and, and, and how they go about it. Two of the issues that we dealt with would be, uh, in this case, Topography, in this case, environmental character. Of course, you deal with uh, the land use, as you saw earlier. We would deal with uh, the views that are shown here. We'd, we'd work with geology. We work with, with all of the parts prior to coming up with our decision. And as part, many of the things related to how we looked at the site in this fashion, how it set up in this fashion, how the geology existed, and so forth. And then in the scheme itself, of course, we tried to uh, this is again is the, the sort of projection of what the commercial center might have looked like. Eric Moss isn't the only one who runs these things across. <laughs> that's one of that's one of my sketches, so we're 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 not that far apart. Uh, anyway, uh, what we tried to do in this scheme was to to hold people within about a half mile walking distance of this. This was meant to be pedestrian through this portion and then vehicular through this portion. Uh, this shows the town center, some of the uh, other development around it. How large was the, how much population? It was only a 10,000 population. So the center is projected a little bit heavy in terms of the way it was done. Uh, we never got into the, the later stages, which we should have. And from uh, the discussions I've given you on new towns and uh, the Friday mornings, you, you know, and, and I know that, that unless we get up into, well, probably a couple hundred thousand, do we really get a center that works in a real strong way? So this would be what you'd call really a, uh, a, a bedroom community, small town, with uh, probably a projection that wasn't as correct as it should have been, particularly as I look at it today, uh, you know, about six years later. Uh, this is another study that was done in the office. This was a, a open, plan, open space and conservation plan for the city of San Clemente. Uh, what, this, is, this is a composite overlay of all of these elements that read over on this side. I hope you can all see them. Uh, and finally, the kind of uh, orange-brown area are, are, the, are the areas that we felt could be developed and we established criteria for this, and the city followed that. Unfortunately, by the time we came in to do this study, a great amount of development had already taken place, but this was to be used for future development, and it's a, a land use study. Uh, another type of study we've been involved with is, is the city of Inglewood. We've done uh, a fair amount of work for the city of Inglewood. Uh, initially, we, we were called in to do a, a CBD study, a central business district study. Uh, at that time, the, what they wanted to do was bring in a regional shopping center, uh, which we were not strongly for, but that was the solution most cities were using to try to upgrade their <coughs> central business district. And then this was a projection of some housing and some uh, development that could take place later. Okay, what finally, this, this, they were never able to make this come about. In the meantime, though, uh, the city of Inglewood, which is rather progressive and has used federal funds quite well, uh, has, did get funds to do some development of, uh, of their Market Street, which is this main street here, which we projected as a closed off street eventually, uh, and start some of the development at this time. Okay, and this is the plan of how to uh, use that particular area to, and change the parking scheme and, and uh, redevelop it. And we've actually continued with this development plus another piece of development plus another street plus some of the, the graphics for the area. And it's, uh, it, it's kind of interesting. I mean, it's a kind of urban design scale that begins to be built. And even though it makes small impact in a sense at the beginning, uh, it it starts to 
become a better thing. This is the way it, it, it looked uh, in, in Inglewood. Uh, this was just shortly after some of the, the revamp was put in, which was, again, the, the center strip set of trees, some of the, the benches park where it's park benches and, and par planting areas, a uh, place for some of the trash. We had designed a whole set of things for this, but they didn't get into that. Uh, more definition of crosswalks, uh, changing the parking scheme that exists. And this would just be like uh, what would be categorized as phase one. Uh, worked on the graphics for the area, which picked up, as you'll see in, in a minute, a, another set of graphics that that uh, we, had, we had begun for the area. Uh, let's see, okay. Another shot of that. And then many of you have come from the airport have probably seen this, which is a portal sign for the city of Inglewood. We have, now there are two of those in existence. I think we were set to do about five of them. And then with the amount of tree planting that's going on and some of the redevelopment, I think you won't see it now, but in probably about five, six, seven, eight, ten years, uh, Inglewood will uh, have, a, have a character rather special compared to others. There's one area, though, that, uh, that I've always sort of felt uh, that they're missing the boat on. And I, I really feel that, that Inglewood is trying to sort of upgrade what is a, a, an area that's sort of going down as a commercial area. Uh, they have two strong points, or three strong points going for it, in my opinion. They have the Forum, they have the Hollywood Racetrack, and they have the airport. And I really feel that, that Inglewood would be much stronger if they would take those elements and build on those elements would, uh, and develop those kinds of things that would be used in conjunction with really what their city is, I think, part, mostly made of. And uh, instead, they're not doing that. But uh, whether the city goes down or not, I don't know. At least they'll have a lot of nice trees in the years to come. <laughs> Uh, we also work on graphics for the city. This is a public parking garage for them, and this is some graphic work we've done. So you see we're doing planning, we're doing graphics, we're doing landscape. Uh, we've done uh, uh, various kinds of work we do. We've taken some of their electric plant areas and uh, worked, worked those over a little bit. Uh, the, the rinse and wash rack for, this, for the, uh, 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 what do we call it? The, I forget what, corporation yard, really, for, for the city. All right, let me go, I'm missing this already. Okay, I'll, I'll, let me go back one on each. Uh, and again, it includes the gas, which goes in relationship to this. Then the building itself, which we worked on and actually originally wanted to, our intent was to have uh, a different image than this completely in terms of what we were working on. We were hoping we could work with metal, metal cladding, and we, we had hoped to have really a, a uh, unit that could be fabricated and brought in and, and developed in this way. Then when we couldn't get that one going because of cost, we then uh, developed the concrete frame, hoping we could infill it with uh, the metal panels, which are more like the door panels, but again, uh, brick proved to be the cheaper material for infill, and, and the building went this way, which I don't feel has the industrial character that I think most of us really wanted in the office. Uh, that one on the right should have been pulled. That's the interior. Now I'm out of sequence. Okay. Having trouble even have these things down. Okay, that's another industrial type building we've dealt with. And again, a large uh, play with landscape in this particular one. Uh, then we've also dealt with rehabs. These two buildings are a block apart from each other. This is one corner which had a kind of a nice old Spanish building, and we just we we did some very simple development with it, cleaned up some of the arches slightly, cleaned up some of the windows uh, through a, an overhead walkway to, for protection, and uh, left the building pretty much alone a block away. Then we went into this new development, which is a s similar kind of a corner with another set of uh, buildings. Some shots through it. Kind of, I keep going wrong. Okay, so many of you may have seen this one in Beverly Hills. And then along with something like this, we've also done work like this. This is in the, in the Barrio in, in East LA. It was part of a total park development, which I don't have shots of. Uh, this was just a, a transition from uh, the school, the way students 
kids would go to school, come down through the park, and then go back into their, their, their housing area. Just, again, showing diversity. Same time, we worked on things like Watts Willowbrook area. This was a study uh, of Century Freeway and the industrial freeway coming together and then taking an, an existing neighborhood and phasing it through a couple of phases where we would develop a, a linkage from the elementary school area and uh, the junior high school area and then a little green area that would go up to the commercial, leaving all the housing in through this part and then some industrial that was right in here. And the object here was to not even though the freeway was coming in and disrupting the, 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 the neighborhood, we were trying to show an example of, of, of how you might keep the neighborhood still intact. Questionable whether they would even want to do that, but this was a, a study on, the, on that kind of an issue. Uh, other kinds of things we've been involved with are student housing. These, were, these are planned schemes. This is, again, a, uh, was set up to do a, a multiple dwelling uh, scheme for Inglewood, we were just setting the standards and we were, sh in order to show the standards, we, we, we set a, few, a scheme down in which we could develop where we felt parking should be, some of the setback rulings, where we felt planting buffers should be and so forth, and this was to be followed then by uh, whoever, whatever group would, would take over the, the planning or the building of this particular development, uh, uh, a, a plan for a scheme for uh, high-cost housing along the ocean and another scheme for low-cost housing that we did out in Pasadena. So we've... No, I want to go here, okay. And this is some of the low-cost housing. Again, this is probably a completely different image and a completely different way that I, from the way I've worked all, most of my career. Uh, this is stuff at at the very lowest cost level. Uh, I think at the time we were shooting for about eight and a half, nine bucks a foot, and uh, therefore using the, the simplest construction techniques one can use, and really all you can do here is, is sort of additive uh, architecture, uh, pretty much just tack on some punched windows. Uh, it was a hard kind of a scheme to work on in, in many ways because it, the latitudes were so, so narrow. But, uh, Go now. Okay, now we I'll, now I jump into the second phase, and what I'm going to do is just deal now with with personal work. Now, all the work that you saw was primarily work that was done, you know, as a team. Now, this goes back to, um, and I'll try to run through it fairly quickly. I won't talk to it as much as I did with the other. Uh, my tendency, I, the desire here is not to talk as much tonight, but I'm already in, into too much talking as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this starts out about 1953-54, that, that area, that, that time frame. Uh, again, usually I've introduced this in previous times with the uh, kind of where architecture was and where I was and what was going on at that particular point in time. Uh, in the early 50s, most of us who had gone to school during the, uh, after, say, from about 45, 46 on, right after the Second World War, were really kind of the first group of architects coming along who were following behind uh, those of, you know, the Wrights and the Gropiuses and the Mies van der Rohe's and uh, the, the Neutros and the Schindlers and the whole, the whole group who had, had developed uh, much of the modern architecture thought. Uh, our goals at that time, and this doesn't express it the best of all the jobs, but I, I'm starting here, uh, were, were to deal with my, my goals at least were, were, were several. First of all, uh, I wanted to not deal with particularly conventional construction techniques uh, totally. I wasn't interested in doing balloon framing. I was primarily interested in, in expressing the attitude of uh, a structure that was then infilled by some form of a panel system. And again, most of architecture, I guess, suffers from the idea that most of the time you're dealing with an idea or a thought process, but quite often not being able to do it in the way that you would really truly like to do it. So what architects tend to do, and they've done that through the industrialized 
periods and every other time in, in the world is to give a look of something that is of what it's trying to do. Uh, that doesn't mean that the structure here is dishonest. It's, a, it's an honest structure. The infill panel, of course, is still a plaster panel or a drywall panel, and it would have been preferably done in another way, and the brick would have been probably a different kind of a material use. But again, this begins this, this dealing with the structural frame, the post and beam frame, the infill wall, and uh, that kind of an, uh, an attitude. And so much of the work that you see here is that. Now, the other things that I was dealing with naturally are, are very much involved with the client's program at this point in time, how the, how the user would be involved with their own house. I spent hours and hours with clients in the, in the early stages uh, dealing with their particular issues. And even though I won't talk to that in every house tonight, I, I have always been user conscious and probably le a little less so in the later stages, but not because uh, the user wasn't involved, but because I was also involved with some other sets of ideas that I wanted to, to deal with. Uh, so we deal with the, with the user, we're dealing with site relationships, uh, we're dealing with the, how to control sun uh, in, by overhangs and by trellises, and you can pretty much see in, in this one that, you know, I've, uh, the overhangs themselves are doing the shading job and uh, the, the trellising is, is developing the cool. This is in the valley where today you might do a, a more closed job. The other, the other, but at that time I was, I was dealing with the trellis as that kind of a thing, the overhang as that kind of a thing in order to develop the same kind of cooling, sometimes water uh, pool that you'll see as we go into this. Okay, so that's the, ma the, the primary sets of issues that I was dealing with and then using glass pretty much as a negative material, in other words, filling the voids and uh, allowing the, the flow of space from inside to outside. And we'll just run through these in fairly quick order. Here I just introduced a few plans, because at this stage I was Again, primarily involved with how the user was going to use the house, and uh, Steve talked to it last week about saving trees and not saving trees. Well, uh, I guess in the West Coast, in most sites, you don't have the tremendous number of trees that, that uh, he had on that Eastern Coast site. But anyway, these are all existing trees on the site, on this one. And this is also another set of existing trees. Therefore, the, the plan relationships are very much related to those so that there was a saving of these. And the way the, the land was used, the front part of this site is a sloping site, flat on the upper site. So I used the, the kids' areas, the pool, their play area, and so forth is on the flat. The family connection and the dining kitchen connection were the mid connection. And the, the living room master bedroom were at this part of the wing. This is just a simple living, you know, dining, study, kitchen, uh, privacy part of the house of, of that sort, or let's say public part, really, and then the bedroom wing over here in, in its, its sense. Uh, the first house that was on the left is, this looks like so. Again, the penetration of walls uh, coming through. My, my work has never been uh, uh, skin work. I, mean, I, I never expressed the skin different from the structure. The structure and the, the, and the, the infill and the walls are always, this, are always the same. An external wall will always be treated uh, both internally and externally the same way. Uh, I don't change materials as I move from outside to inside as many architects do. And I try to develop the penetrations and the, and the, the pulling out of, of, of the wall forms. This again probably falls back more onto uh, much of uh, Wright's, many of Wright's principles and it probably would also then be f furthered later by many of uh, Neutra's attitudes. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's an attitude today that seems to be uh, not used uh, at all by most designers. And uh, at that time, and I think it's, I still think it's very appropriate for the Southern California area, and I think we're, you'll probably, well, you won't see it now because of the, uh, uh, the problem with energy, but uh, the, the ability to really <coughs> knock down the inner the, the, the change from inside to outside was really a goal that many of us were working with, and I particularly was working that way. Uh, today, m many people are working just the opposite. How do you actually separate the exterior from the interior? So it's, there are two sets of philosophies. They both probably have their degree of validity, and you make your choice and go your way. 
but this again is the the attempt always to, to penetrate even with the steps and moving those through, uh, moving yourself out from the inside uh, with more openings than, and less solids. And in these cases, again, about the only solids usually were shear walls and, uh, in this kind of a scheme. This then was the house um, that I showed you on the second plan. Uh, these are where the trees penetrated that house. Again, a fairly simple post and beam kind of a house at that time. Uh, I'm going to head on that one again. I'm having trouble with that. Okay. And then that was the outside deck. This face is north, and again, again, it's it's a really it's it's dealing primarily with site relationships, views. Uh, planning schemes and those those sets of issues and a simple construction method which was normally uh, a post and beam system. Another house of a similar kind of vernacular doing some of the same things that the others were doing. Developing privacy courts versus the view side on the, on the other. Another house. So this one sets up a little different set of issues. This is all a steel columned house and a big float roof, and the, the steel columns here allowed this to have no shear panels and a complete opening to the view side. Where is that, right? That's in Baldwin Hills area. Uh, again, let me, let me just stop for a minute, uh, because you're seeing mostly wood houses, and, and let me, I want to explain that, and except for this one that I developed, we did with, with, a, with a steel column. I used wood not so much that I was in love with wood. I mean, had, had steel been a competitive material, I probably would have done mostly steel houses at, at, at the same time. Uh, wood was always cheaper. Wood could accomplish somewhat the same things, except that you did need the shear panels. Uh, and okay. uh, as a result, I, I, I didn't use steel through most of my jobs. I tried through this whole period of time usually to be uh, about 10% higher than what would be normal cost. These are not trying to be the, they were, they were never trying to compete with dingbats at the lowest level of cost. If, if, if the general costs were running about $10 a square foot at the, at the earliest period, I was running 11. When they were running 11 or 12, I was running 14. Uh, I felt for what the people were getting in terms of space and in terms of in relationship with their sites and views and, and what came about through this process that the extra dollar to a square foot was probably, uh, should have been worth it to them and it usually was because uh, this is what they were looking for in terms of lifestyle. They couldn't get it in the, in the typical uh, tract house that was available to them just as they can't today. Uh, most of these houses, by the way, were for very uh, young people not people who had a lot of money. They were usually, uh, quite often they were engineers with uh, either Hughes or, or some of them worked with Rand Corporation. Uh, I seem to have a lot of those type of clients and they were excellent clients. Uh, and the, the, the greatest satisfaction I had through this period was that I think every client I ever had during this period and really later other than for a couple of exceptions, always felt that the house I did for them was the best house I ever did. And uh, that always made me feel good because it, it, it made me feel that I was really uh, solving their problems. And even later when I was dealing so much with my own problems instead of their problems, people still feel that, that the house is still uh, so much more for them than any of the others that I've done. And, th and this is kind of a nice, nice feeling. And I, but I don't have the patience I once did and I don't deal with the issues quite the way I, I once did. At this time I used to spend hours and hours and nights and nights <laughs> in clients' conferences and really making friends of most of the clients and, and enjoying it and enjoying that inner relationship. Uh, and I think it was partly due to the fact that, that they were, uh, that they didn't have a lot of money, that uh, by doing the job they, they got more than they would have gotten the other way and I think there was an appreciation that was very special at that time. Just some other houses of varying types. That isn't very true color. Most, a lot of you have probably been in this house, but it's, it's awfully hot color. It isn't that hot. 
I'm just running through these. Again, I'm showing this plan. This, this house is, was developed on pilings. And uh, again, this is right up near my house on Rustic Canyon. The, uh, this breakback relates to the, the stream itself. And the piling system is based, in most cases, trying to get 16 feet on center on, on this square unit. Uh, I think I was 20, 24 on this group here, but all these again run into the 16. These are the support points here, 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 and here. And it just it expresses the piling locations on up, and it dealt with it in this way. Now again, you could deal with this stream in many, many ways. This house followed from uh, the client having seen a house that dealt with another, a set of issues like so, and it followed somewhat the same thinking processes. Now, quite often, that's what will happen again in, in housing types that you deal with uh, for private <coughs> clients. One client will like what, what they've seen for somebody else, and so for a period, you'll deal with sometimes the same issues uh, over and over in, in various ways. This, again, is just trying to show you the structural system in a uh, clearer form, the red lines here, following through as the over, overriding pattern, even though the house is moving around a fair amount within this, this total. This house bridges from the street, the car parking goes under, it develops through several levels and, and two stories through here, half levels through here, uh, and so forth, and from the pool side and from the front side, inside again. Okay, and then during this whole period of time, I also did a series of garden apartments, and uh, I just want to run through these so that you can get some idea of what I was working with. This is a little <laughs> six-unit apartment building that I did. It was actually my first job. It was done about, I guess, well, I guess 22 years ago. Uh, again, it was a very, these were 600-square-foot apartments, plus or minus. They varied. I had a movable wardrobe through here, so in some cases people would move this to develop a very tight bedroom, a larger living room, and so forth. But they were, they were small units, they were for small, they were for single people or, or for young couples, and uh, that's about where I was with my head at that time. And so I guess I was thinking in those terms when I was dealing uh, with people. And they've been, they've been successful apartments uh, through the whole period of time, I don't think. I don't think I've had a, there's been a vacancy in these, this apartment in 22 years. Uh, let me go back here. Oh, wait. So this is, this is this apartment right here, and this is the deck it works on. If any of you have been in Doug's place, it's this little unit here. There are two patios to this side. This was done on a spin plan. It's a rotated system uh, so that each of the upper stories has the patio over the one in front. And then uh, here I, w since I did this with Carl Maston, uh, who did the, the building next door to it, uh, and we tried to keep our materials similar and keep our, even though we designed them differently, they were to have, they, they could be worked in conjunction. Uh, here I was, knowing what the architect on this side would do, I was able to take advantage of his side yard. So, uh, I could extend my patios and get that extension into his side yard. And this is the advantage of two people working together who, who uh, are dealing with the same kind of issues. Usually architects are, are not doing that. They're trying to make their statement against another s statement that's on, uh, alongside of them. There's no con coordination and you get this kind of uh, sort of free-for-all. This is mine, this is yours, and so forth. I'm proud to say that usually here, uh, people think I designed both of them, or if they talk to Carl, they think he designed both of them, and I think this is a nice feeling uh, where two architects can work together doing di di different but similar things and, and make them together. I don't have two shots side by side, so I'm, I wish I should have done to go into that explanation. Another garden apartment, another one. Another one that was done at that time, somewhat in the same vein. Always dealing with privacy in the outside little patio and the, the garden itself through this period. And I did several apartments of this type. And then I went into another period. And this one deals a little closer. It's about the only time I dealt uh, <clears throat> more with the skin. Here there's really no, uh, not too much. There's no, this isn't really a structural kind of a scheme. It, it deals with a system of of bearing walls and span between. And, and then I was trying to, at this stage, uh, reach down and be competitive 
at the apartment house market uh, with the cheapest stuff being done. And of course, the way to do that is to use conventional construction methods, the, using plaster. And then, which many people don't bother with anymore because they just they write everything in through one plane, and I don't think that's bad. This deals with a whole set of little issues of, of, of massing that develops slight shadow, slight play. And the other thing that it has going for it probably is the idea of this kind of a walkway in which privacy is gained by, by dropping this balcony movement system below the upper deck level so that people walking by aren't looking into each other, yet it still allows the, uh, the balcony approach or quarter approach to the unit. And uh, so it's a small idea, but it, it worked quite well, giving privacy and still developing that kind of a thing. Of course, it's a two-story unit. And this was done, I don't know, what, 10, 12 years ago, 14 years ago. So. And this is some of the things I was talking about, just working with little reveals and little, little plays through the massing uh, and some window treatments, same kind of thought process going on. And one of the ideas on this particular set of this building was to get rid of the elevator on a three-story building. This is fairly common now when I did it quite a few years back. It wasn't, quite, it wasn't, it wasn't really being done that I know of that much. And this is where the first floor apartments are, one-story apartments. Uh, as I then moved to uh, the second floor, these are studio types. And we got rid of, uh, there could then be a walkway system. And it's a very tightly packed uh, apartment unit on a, on a builder's type site. Yet the privacy is, is developed through the decks and the patios and, and the individual uh, parts that were, were, were separated out. Okay, and that was the third floor of the same, the unit I just showed, and, uh, okay, let me go back. I have these down, every time I look the other way, I, I change them. <laughs> Here's where I want to be. Okay, and then this, now we're getting towards where I'm going to be taking off into my main thinking process for tonight, and... <clears throat> This was the last building of, of that series, and originally it was, it was designed to be an all-plastered building as well. The owner of this one, though, wanted to incorporate some wood elements, and so this is the way it came about. Okay, now this was a series of just uh, vertical massing, uh, no real structural significance here. Uh, it's a fairly, you know, it's fairly typical in, in many in many ways. Uh, I developed a furring system to pick up some of the, the spans and to keep some of the doors in, in conventional sizes. But uh, it's just somewhat the same thought process as we, we just went through. It was this building, though, that, that started to change my thinking greatly towards uh, how these things should be done. It was 20-some units. Uh, I felt because of it, they had some simil they had similarities throughout, but the control and supervision just seemed to be so difficult. What was going on in w one kitchen was different from what was going on in another, even though they were designed the same. There were just a million little parts that weren't being controlled uh, the way I thought they should be. And then this site to this side was also owned by the same owner, and there was a projection for another set of condominiums there. And at that time, uh, I started to think in the office about a system that uh, would, would make more sense. I mean, could we not control uh, the development better if we started developing, this is, I guess, about, this is 63, 64. Uh, if we did, if we, if we developed the vertical towers, uh, spanned across with a structural system, uh, built the unit on the site, but craned it in and slipped it in. So it was, the object was to go to a slip-in system. Uh, Later, you'll see the rest of my thinking really relates to that. I, I'm going to insert here a project that was done in, in the partnership, but really showed the, uh, the idea that, we, that was never accomplished on that site next door to the one I, I did before. And this was a student housing scheme for Sonoma State. Uh, and here uh, it shows the development of an 8 by 12 uh, vertical stack. This is it in its horizontal position, taken to the vertical. Uh, the, the lamb beam 
system that would span across the slip in of the of the bedroom and the living room units, uh, the tack on of the uh, balcony system. And in plan now, you'll start to see this kind of notation used throughout so that there's a consistency in the rest of the things I'll show you. Uh, th these units were always bath or kitchen units. They were always 8 by 12 by varying lengths, depending on what was needed. That way, they could either have been built on the site, they could be transported to the site, and uh, they, could, they could deal in, the mo in that kind of a modular system. Uh, the bedrooms would either be in this case, this is a 12-foot dimension plus 4 plus 4, so we're looking at uh, 20 feet in, in this kind of a unit. Uh, this would be the 12-foot uni unit itself. So we have the, the core units turned vertically, the slip-in of the, the living bedroom units. And this goes back to the, the served and s service kind of element as well. It, the, the thing that I started to like about it and why I use it so much later through the rest of my thinking processes, and many of you have discovered this as you've worked on your own projects, is you get rid of these elements, these things can almost do anything. Uh, once you pull uh, the bath and the kitchen and those elements out in some way, uh, your, your other elements can then be uh, kind of open-ended and they, they have much, you can get much more variety out of this. And what I'll start to show as I go through this is the kind of uh, diversity that can be established off a single scheme or a single scheme idea and uh, that it doesn't have to always end up being the typical box situation and that it can do quite a few things for you. Okay, now let's see. This is a sketch of, well, no, wait, let, me, let me go back again. Okay. Let me, let me run through this, this series first. This is just showing you the service core in its position, some blow-ups. The bedroom unit, described a little better, if you can see it, as it's slip-in. Again, the, the open ceiling here, this part being exposed to the weather, uh, this part going between beams. And again, in this kind of a thing, uh, in some cases, those would be fur down, in other cases, no, not. We would run our services between, where am I? Did I lose it? Can you see that? I can't, oh, there it goes. I don't know what, what happened. I'm not getting it. Well, anyway, between beams would be your, your service movement, and you, you could swing through here. Turn it off. so you can get a better idea. Balcony unit set on. And then the plan development in, in how they could then be tied together. Uh, you know, bathroom, kitchens, tied usually at a service point, another kind of a development that could take place back to back, and then units working this way. These were two-story units. These were one story. We had some situations where we could cut out parts and go two stories with those two. So we had a variety of units here. These were set up for, at that time, we were looking at, at the potential for um, uh, sort of cooperative ventures in which people could live uh, uh, together in, in, a, in a cluster if they wanted to, or they could have separation. These were this is student housing types. Okay, and then this is a diagram of, or a drawing of what it would have looked like. And some of the plan diagrams that would take place over the site. Okay, now I'm going to move into the private house that develops from the same idea. And Jerry, can I have, I think, let's see, I'm... I'm out of this tray, so uh, you want to give me that? Uh, you want to give me the other tray? Uh, give me the, the yeah the tray over on 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 this side. Replace it. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, this is this is my own house that that followed very shortly after that condominium and after this the, this thinking process. And the first house I designed for this site was a completely different kind of a thing. And uh, by the time I it was more like the condominium in its thought process and like some of the other plaster jobs that I showed. And then as I was thinking about the other kind of a site, the other thing that I would be doing, it happened that. On this site, I couldn't, couldn't build what I first started to build. We broke ground, and the water problems were so great on the site that I, I felt that I would be able to test out some of the thinking that I had gotten into, at least in a, in a uh, not in a real sense, but in a sense of, of, of attitude only. And so the tower system worked very well here. It, it limited the amount of water that would be moved on the site. It allowed the house to be spanned across the site. It uh, led me to the development of concentrating the, uh, all my seismic uh, forces into the concrete uh, pi uh, column system, and then spanning between with the lamb beams that, that step up as we go, go through the house. Uh, another shot of it that gives you some idea of how it went together on the on this side of some of the construction techniques that were going on. Now, the idea, if I would have carried it ideally, you know, would have been, in a, in a house it's pretty hard to do this, it isn't really large enough, but would have been to slip in these elements in through this this area right here. And actually the idea could, could work where you just slide uh, elements in. I didn't build it that way because, it, again, it wouldn't make sense on a site of this large and there weren't enough repetitive elements to make it make sense. Uh, again, plan-wise, if you can re relate back to what we had before, you see the, the core elements, you see the, the bedroom unit slipped in, uh, each piece that could have been slid through and slipped in, but each one again would have its own uh, element to it. Here, uh, again, I, I deviated to some degree by pulling kitchen into a, a larger space instead of keeping it in the core uh, and in a, a slight enlargement on one of the bathroom areas. So there will be deviations from you know, the, the, the initial thought process, but the idea is still somewhat the same. And then this is the construction uh, method that took place. I think that one's a little out of focus. about as good as it goes, I guess. Okay. This was the mechanical service element. This was uh, showing the way the services went from the kitchen to this bath. They, they shot down through this gallery way. They picked up this part. They dropped at that point over on the, on the left side down to, to the ground, and it only it's carried through at one point. Uh, to the street. So I, I didn't want my services running all over the site because of the water problem, so I had to concentrate them and bring them through. Again, some of the construction system. And over here, the plan form now, you can see it more directly. The towers that are used for storage elements, studio level, main f and main floor level. This is the master bedroom. These are the kids' rooms. And the main part of the house then is the public area, which is living room, upper living room, dining, <laughs> kitchen, and the studio is down below in that area. Section through the house. In this, I didn't describe, actually, the, the way the site was used was that I, I stepped my beams up in relationship to the slope of the existing site. So in this direction, again, first set of beams is, is here, then I go against that with another set. Uh, I come against that again with another set, and each time uh, it zeroes out at, at the point of slope. So the house responds very directly to the site. In this, this, longitud in this section and in the longitudinal so section, it steps up the hill in the same way. These are exactly the natural contours. No, changing in the contour other than right at the parking area. OK, can I have that other? Oh, it's OK. I, I got it, I think. Do you want is three turned on? OK. Now, I, I'm going to take you through uh, one house, my house in particular, in a very thorough way. And this here primarily because I want to deal with 
the element not only of structure, which I always deal with, mechanical systems, which were dealt with in this particular one, uh, perception is going to be a, a key one here as I, as I move you through. And even though the system is a very regular system in a sense, uh, I feel that one of the goals that I've always uh, s s s tried to accomplish uh, was to keep a, a simple system, a regular system, a strong constru construction system and technique, uh, at the same time developing a progression of space and dealing with a whole set of, of, of perceptions that can take place within a, a simple system. So starting from street side, moving up the walk to the entry door, coming on through. Well, a lot of you have been through the house, but let me just take you through on slides. It's, the only reason I'm showing mine, I could do it with a lot of houses, but I don't usually sta spend as much time photographing them, and I don't have the time to, to do it in the same way, and I can't catch the times of day in quite the same way that you can in your own place. So here's entering the house, uh, the skylight in all of these tower elements that, that throw light down into the space, uh, the, the definite point of, of stepping across from landing to landing and using glass in this kind of a manner, which actually reflects up to the skylight. So those people who are not aware of the light coming in, as they start to make their move across the landings, they, their tendency is always to look down for protection. And as they look down, they see up, which tends to then, as they move across, then tends to throw your eyes up, as I showed before, to the, to the skylight. As you move up the landing, uh, you get a shot through a a, uh, a void that then lets you somewhat in, look into the studio and, and see across into that, that space. Uh, it's just one more visual thing as you're moving through that, that is experiential as you're coming up through the stair itself. Um, you, again, uh, again, glass used reflecting up, looking down, uh, looking back down into the stair once you're up at the top and the kinds of things that, that happen within it. Uh, Again, as you come to the very top landing, the first perception you have of the house uh, is this then this, this opening up of, of a very large space. As you noted, uh, the entry came through a very tight space. It gets down to about seven feet. And as you move up the stair, you're getting into another kind of a, a whole set. As you enter the, the major space, then it opens up very strongly on you. Now, none of this was, I mean, in a sense, it was that was not the preconception prior to starting the, that whole progression. It came out of the, the process by which the house was built. But again, I can't, you know, where the process stops and where the subjective infill takes place, it's really hard ever to define that. And any of you, as you start to design and as you have designed in the school, know that that's always very difficult. And when we ask you to be uh, develop process in your thinking and show us how you went through various stages and what was your backup and what did you do and w you know what were your thinking process. You know that in your own head at various points in time uh, uh, some kinds of images and some, some subjectivity starts to move in and then it starts to play its role uh, in, the, in the game. Uh, so in, 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 this, in my own house and in many houses that followed, I tried to keep the subjectivity to, to the minimum and allow it to, to play its role afterwards, uh, rather than, say, come in with the preconception of, of the way I wanted to deal with spaces and let the spaces evolve and do their job for the owner and then have that take place. The entire space from the dining room on out to the deck. Looking down into the fireplace corner of the living room. Uh, Across the entire space from the dining room on out to the deck. Back again. Sort of the major space of the house then from the kitchen looking back through the whole house. Down into the studio living room, upper living room. Kind of one continuous space. Some of the elements of the, the house and skylights again working through. My use of color is really quite often more in the 
not in the, the walls themselves, as you saw last week in, in some of Terry's work and, and, and Steve's work when they were showing uh, uh, framing and framing through. Uh, usually, I've usually tried to work in natural materials and keep the natural materials the main part of the, of the frame and the framework and then let the color play against that. Uh, in either through furnishings or other pla other planes or other other parts of the house, uh, such as in you know this bathroom. And again, the bathroom here, which becomes a very dramatic vertical space, was not preconceived that way. It was just that the tower had to go this high to receive the beams related to the site and how it would be used. But then the way it's handled in a design sense later is is how the elements then are juxtaposed and and and, and moved through. Some of the outside deck areas moving around the house. There are a lot of slides. <laughs> Front deck. deck off the studio. And then I go back and then you know, I want to talk a little bit about detail as well. Uh, again, the glass is used in what some people would categorize as a, in a negative sense. Uh, <clears throat> actually, John Johansson, who stopped by the, ho the house uh, before he went to give his talk last night and spent a little time uh, with us, uh, m made a statement that he felt it was, uh, you know, one of the best uses of negative glass he had ever been involved with. And that means just that the glass is used as the infill uh, here to the system. And it's not used as a skin. It's not used as a, uh, in any other way than to, to allow the most freedom in this, the, I mean, to express the structure, allow the freedom of movement from inside to outside throughout. So therefore, then I get involved with trying to deal with it in, in this, kind of the simplest way possible. I could have even, and this is one of the, as I go through it, you'll see what, what happens. Here, I, the attempt here was to pull it off, uh, miter it into the concrete in order to make the concrete be understood as the supporting element. And uh, then, even though the mullion takes place over to uh, the other side, uh, there I would have liked to have had less going on and, and really have diminished that mullion so that there'd be no confusion at all of what's holding what up. And the attempt here to uh, show that the, the concrete's doing the job, not the post, and, and have the system work in that sense. We'll just go through and look at glass now. Again, the, the mitered corner, which opens up the corner and, and uh, pulls it off the structure. You'll see more of that. And then the residual that you get out of glass, which is, I, I think, kind of neat. And that's all the reflectivity that takes place at various times of day, the way glass works at night, which is different completely than the way it works in the daytime. Uh, all of these, I think, are, are kind of neat things. And these are things that you don't pre-design at all. I mean, the, there was no uh, thinking about this particularly. I mean, glass here was used, as I said, as, as the void area and as the viewing area. And uh, then what's nice is what these kinds of things that start to happen, where you get reflections back from the garden. It tends to mirror things. And this is just ordinary glass. This isn't uh, either mirrored glass or tinted glass of any sort. But it starts to break these things down. And many of the, you get what I categorize as very interesting kinds of uh, perceptions that, that one experiences. Uh, sometimes the duplication of an interior space to the external space uh, uh, within a very a, a system that is meant not to be confusing in general, uh, you get these things that, that kind of break down some of that and they add another element to to the, the design as, as these things play through. Uh, again, various kinds of distortions and re reflections 
And if your glass isn't perfectly clean, you get other kinds of patterns taking place. Uh, reflections back of doors, plants reflected two ways. And these are kind of neat experiences as you move through, through, a, through a house. And I'm sort of sad at this point, of course, I'll use that as I get near my ra closing part, uh, that, that, that <clears throat> due to the energy attitude, the amount of glass now being able to be used in houses has been diminished. And I think, and I don't think correctly so, and I'll speak to that because I think it's, it's a little bit ridiculous. Uh, because I think we lose a good element uh, in, in housing. I think this one's particularly interesting because you don't really know where you are at this point as you look through this glass. You're reflecting various things back and forth from a door back into a window, back from another reflection. And it's kind of interesting. I mean, these are just nice things to take place with the realities of life as you move through any, any building. And then when you're back on this side looking back, you're reflecting one more time. And again, none of this is preconceived. It's all happenings more than anything else, which is what I like about it. And then just the normal outlook through the same kind of space and movement through. And then the kind of qualities you get on a rainy day, which are different from a sunny day, a whole different kind of quality that one feels in a, around a space. Here the site was left primarily in its natural state. We've practically done no planting. And because of the spring condition that I was just talking about earlier but didn't talk maybe enough about, the site has springs running th over the whole thing. It's, it's always wet, so it grows very well, except in one place that I, I didn't have success with. And that's, I thought I had enough light under the house to make to, for, for plants to grow. But it just, on, on the, this particular east side exposure, I'm not getting enough light. And I don't show that anywhere. But if you ever come and visit the house, you'll note that on that side, under the house, it just it won't grow anything to, to speak of. And, but the rest of the site grows pretty much naturally. We planted very little and have had practically no upkeep in, in, letting, in, in involvement with it. Uh, <clears throat> still the same rainy day and the birds that come to drink the water and take their bird baths in, your, in the pooling system. Uh, the kind of play of droplets on the skylights, which is nice to look at. Uh, not too nice when you're trying to go to sleep. <laughs> And then, again, another residual that you get after the rains with the water that sits on the skylight and then reflects back as the sun hits through it and throws patterns around all the walls and all the surfaces, which is uh, a kinetic aspect of the whole thing, which I think is kind of great. And other kinds of sunlight patterns that take place through skylights. But most of these, with the height, fall on the wall. Want to give me the second tray, Jer? Talking about the energy thing while I'm doing this, the, the thing that bothers me, and of course I'm, I've been in the process of doing this study, but I haven't ever completed it, and I hope to as soon as we get through with this accrediting thing, visit next week, and that's to go back to all the houses that I'll be showing you and trying to get uh, exact takeoffs on, on their costs. And I know in my own case that I spend exactly the same amount of money per year, and, and, and I assume then somewhat in the same amount of energy consumption to, to heat my hot water as I do to heat my house. And uh, therefore, I don't really comprehend it as a, as a heating, as a great saving in heating energy, because that isn't a tremendous amount of money or probably a very great amount of, of energy use. And even though, OK, it has a little more heat loss, maybe, than, or for sure, than, than, uh, than the most, than the house that has 20% glass, the, the, the quantities, I think, are so minimal. And to place it on the private house, <clears throat> which only composes or comprises maybe 
a couple of percent of all housing, if that, maybe, maybe even less than, than one percent, is just a, a, a ridiculous way to go about the process. I mean, I can understand it in large-scale multiple housing, maybe, but when we know that the energy used is by commercial and industrial enterprise at, uh, at, in the proportion of around 70 percent of, of energy usage, uh, to lay it on the house or the home is really a ridiculous, I think, a ridiculous point of view and, and is a very minimal kind of an issue. In fact, my own feeling, and I think I will, it'll prove out as I go into the study, is that the volume, uh, that there are many other issues that one has to deal with, and, and that is uh, the volume, uh, the kind of weather conditions naturally that, that exist, uh, how you you let sun into the house without, say, landing on the, on the floor itself through, through parts of the day, which is really a solar gathering process in itself. And it only makes a little bit of, the only time it makes sense at all is when you're talking about air conditioning, particularly on the west coast. We have so few months that really we deal with heat, which is probably three, four months of the year, that it really isn't, I don't think, an issue at all. And so I'm hoping, and I know the AIA has finally gotten into the the, the swing on this because they were completely out of it during the time the ruling was going on, but to come back and really deal with this, this, these issues more on energy, the energy consumed not on the quantity of glass you use, but really on how you, you deal with the glass that you do use. And uh, I know what, what I'm hoping to get out in the next couple of months is, is something to help support uh, that kind of a, a, a set of issues because from my standpoint, it is, it is completely closed me out of, uh, of even having anything to do with, with the housing issue anymore because of, it, it goes so far against the kinds of processes that I've dealt with uh, through the time I've been working. Again, some shadow play. And then what happens at night where you, you completely close down and you get other kinds of reflections but you no longer get the penetrations. In, in earlier work, I used to always work to light up the yard so the penetration at night would be identical to the penetration in the daytime. And I've come through living through this process to find, in the last eight, nine years, to find that I, I kind of enjoy the change uh, that takes place. And so that at, at night you get kind of a closure off the black glass and a different set of reflections than you get in the daytime and maybe slight penetrations just to let you know that some things are happening outside, but not necessarily to light up that whole yard, to throw it in in the same sense that it goes on in the daytime. Uh, both, both methods are fine. I think it depends on what you're trying to do. I, I kind of, this gives you a different kind of a change of pace and uh, different kinds of reflections than you had in the daytime. And kind of sp spotting, this is a very, lowly, low-lit house. I tend to like low lighting, and uh, this is something that I always have a little bit of trouble with with my clients, because some clients like high-intensity lighting. I, I prefer kind of a low uh, light system that, that deals with just spotlighting throughout the house, and particularly in, in houses of, that are brown or wood. I mean, your, your reflectivity is so low that it's almost impossible to really light a house up in a bright sense, and in some ways just this this sort of change of pace is kind of nice. And I guess different people have different kinds of eyes that work uh, in, in special kinds of ways. And uh, mine seem to work better in dim light and low light. And you probably see me quite often working around here without light and sitting over at a desk. And Anne sometimes wonders when and why. But I think different people work differently. <clears throat> and then the moon, which was that was always part of the skylight system, which I, that I knew would happen and uh, knew that it would be enjoyable at night to be able to look, to, to follow the moon around in special ways around a, around a house. And this is a very kind of exciting thing to have happen because it, it comes up at various places, as you know, and sometimes it's overhead and coming full through the skylight. Sometimes it's coming through other parts of the house. It, again, makes other kinds of reflections, and it's, it's a rather pleasant perceptual quality. So again, this is trying to uh, take you through the many moods of one particular job, uh, even though the system uh, is not a romantic system. The system is, a very, is, is very unromantic in, in terms of the way it's put together, 
but develops uh, the romantic qualities, I think, that a lot of people work very hard to get, and you can actually sometimes accomplish them through very simple processes uh, if your thinking goes right. Okay, now, now I'm going to just run you through a series that work off the same system. Many of you have seen these, many of you have been in them, but the new students haven't. And the reason I'm going through this whole thing for one more time is we usually have about 100 new students per year, and uh, I don't know how much any of you know about the faculty or know about me, so I have to kind of run through the processes. Okay, this one is the Gertler House down near, not too far from me. It works on the same kind of system. It takes a few more liberties. Uh, plan scheme, again, is a series of uh, support elements, uh, usually, usually service, but not necessarily always service, uh, the way the units could be plugged in again. And I just differentiate color to show you separation of how they could be pieced together. Uh, this is the, the, the ground floor plan. Again, the house is raised above the ground. Uh, there was a site, pr both of these now have had site problems in terms of of fill conditions, so uh, what I've tried to do is concentrate again the foundation points and then span between these. That gives me then the trade-off of the foundations that you would normally have with the beams that then uh, come at the first floor level and frame a whole different network. So uh, main, main, main floor area and then the master bedroom. Level. Are these out of focus? I can't. Huh? I can't really read them well. Can you can you focus me in on that one, Jerry? Okay. There. I was getting kind of bleary-eyed myself. <laughs> okay. And here again, it comes up. To, I, these have never been. I don't call out the names of the rooms and so forth because it's, these are really diagrams, diagrams of what, what takes place and it might be hard for you to differentiate between in and out. But uh, the element that just goes vertically through the center is the bedroom and, and bath and, and study. The roofs are then used for decks and there's a deck off to the right side of the master bedroom and there's a deck across to the left side. And you'll see some of that as we move through it. Those are the, those are the roof decks off the master bedroom that we looked at. This is the way it was fit in in the, in the trees. My sites never looked like Steve's sites looked last week. <laughs> yes, I don't, I don't, I, if, I, if I take down one tree, I feel like I've massacred the site. So, but I'm not saying I haven't, I don't take down a tree once in a while because you, it's tough when you walk on, get on a site like this and the site was very much like this. Uh, in fact, it, it was a hard site for, some, for the real estate person to sell. I, I, I sold it for him because nobody could visualize what the hell would go on on the site. They couldn't even orient themselves when they moved onto the site. And, uh, and this, the client that bought it happened to come in with a, a site in another part of town. And uh, they started to describe what they really wanted. And then I said, well, I, I know one that's just terrific. And, and if you're interested, I'll show it to you. And I took him over to the site and described the kinds of things that could be done on it. And they sold the other site and bought this one. And uh, it was a good choice by them because they ended up with a very, very, very good spot. It's surrounded by a park. And uh, it's like having about a, a thousand acres of, of your own. And yet you're on, a, on the tightest of sites. If I go back to the, the plan a minute, uh, let me see if the first, I'm sorry I'm to do this to you. I, I don't show the site plan, but the, this this takes up the whole. <laughs> I'm sorry. It takes uh, it takes up the whole site practically. The side yard is five feet to that side, five feet to this side. It, I'm I'm exactly on the set setback lines, but as far as what they get out of it, it 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 gives them tremendous extensions. Um, The only problem with, with building on sites where you're so involved with trees is it's very hard to step back and take a photograph. You, 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 can only, you only get fragments, and in a way, maybe it works very well for the way I designed, because in a sense, the system is a fragmented system. It's built up of components that are then interconnected, and as a result, you never get that total skin quality, and you're not really dealing so much with shades and shadows and, and kind of the elements that people work with when they're dealing with a piece of uh, a building in, in, a, in an urban scape. 
and maybe they have strong shadows falling on it. The, actually, the sun and the tree shadows tend to break the whole, the whole building down, and uh, the fragments just become probably more fragmented. So therefore, it has to be shown with a series of slides rather than a single. And this is like an unusual condition where one part will break open enough usually to, to shoot it. It's a completely different kind of interior space than, than my house. It's all a single level. It uh, doesn't break nearly as much. It's not as open. Uh, it's based on a similar system, but it's, it, sets a, it, it, it solves a whole different set of, of user needs. And, uh, and, I, and I believe very strongly in the user using the place. And I, I used to be concerned about designing every piece of furniture and worrying about everything, where it was placed, what was going on. And after many years of fighting that losing battle and being frustrated, I now accept the fact that, that I'm developing a framework. They do what they want to do. If it's, if it's in good taste, fine. If, it's, if it isn't, OK, too. What, they're, uh, what they involve themselves with is, is their prerogative and not, not mine. And, and uh, I, I really like this a lot better. Uh, they've allowed me to. Uh, uh, satisfy their needs and, and deal with their goals through a process of dealing with processes that I want to do at the same time. And so I feel the trade-off is very, very good. It's not uh, participatory design in the sense that the owner is designing anything. The, designer, the owner is making the greatest amount of decisions, though, in the early stages in, in, the, in the method or the attitude of how rooms will, will go together and how they will deal with adjacencies. Ray, to what extent do you try to educate the client through this process? Well, in later in the early years, I had to do a lot of that. You know, in other words, I, that's why I used to spend so much time. In later years, uh, I haven't as much. Usually, the client has come for a particular house or a particular attitude, and so therefore, they've accepted they've accepted what I'm about, I guess. And they, they let that happen. Although in the latter houses, the really last one I did, it became more of a frustration uh, in that area because uh, it, the value system never got together with the house. And it was very hard for me to make decisions in relationship to it. But generally speaking, the, the client has let me take go on, on, the, on in this way. However, you know, they, knowing that I left out balcony rails on my house, they will say, you know, I want balcony rails in mine. I've got little kids. I don't want this to happen. Uh, I, if they've experienced my house at, at night and they don't like the lighting intensity, we will add lighting for what they have. If they don't want to move up and down through a great progression of, of, of half flight changes and so forth, I don't do it. I mean, I, I solve their need in relationship to their to what they're trying to do. But at the same time, I, the, the only thing that I keep that I've been working on through this whole process. And, and I guess I didn't really explain it well enough. Uh, I hope it was understood in the first, the first set. What I've been trying to deal with is, is a repetitive, modular kind of an idea that can give you a tremendous amount of diversity. That's all. So therefore, the, 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 the system of support stays somewhat consistent. The method of how they interrelate changes. And my, my philosophical overview is that I think you could take modular housing and make them make it just as exciting as any of these very expensive individualized uh, houses. But most people always deal with it in the sense of a, a box that has a set of limits and no change that can take place in it. And I don't think that that has to be. And this was just a process by which I was trying to prove in my own head whether it could, could or could not be done. And as I said, I've taken, I, I haven't stayed true to my scheme right down to the nth degree. I've taken some liberties, but I don't think the liberties are beyond uh, the, the scope of, of the attitude. OK, so the education process, as you asked about, Terry, has not had to be very strong in the, in the latter years. I'd say in the last 10 years, I haven't had to do much education. Uh, the clients are fairly, usually fairly sensitive people, and they've come 
uh, with an, an attitude about what they wanted and, and uh, know about what they're going to get. And that's, it's nice through part of your life to have that happen. After a while, I mean, I've come, as I conclude tonight, you'll find that I've kind of come to an end of an era anyway. And, but through an, an era, it's kind of nice to be able to explore it and still have clients on your side in general. Okay. Furnishings in this are sensitively handled. Did you no, this influence is, this? No, this was done. This was done by Jerry Cavanaugh, actually. Uh, she, I would say it's a combination, really. I give a lot of, in this case, a great deal goes to the owner. In other words, uh, Jerry was responsible for the dining room table, uh, responsible for uh, the seating group in this area, uh, responsible, I'm sure, for some of the, the, the thought processes in the, the pillow choice and some of these things. All of the things, the hangings and the, Everything else that goes on that makes up the total scene is really the owner's own purchases that they've bought at various places where they've gone in their own collecting. And I think the combination of the two uh, work pretty well. I would have just as soon worked with this one, uh, but for some reason they, they wanted to, uh, I think, get into it differently. And sometimes you'll find, as an architect, the difference that I find, if that's what your real question was, uh, on, on whether you stay with the furnishings or so forth, uh, I find that that's always been s sort of hard, and I don't know why. There's something about, uh, they'll let you do, they'll, they'll always let me do, at least, my thing in terms of the structure and getting everything together, but somehow when it gets down to the furnishings, the clients tend to want to become more precious about that, and as I said, I finally just accepted that. And I used to like to work with them in terms of some color choices, fabric choices, but they would do the lay work, and then we would talk about all, you know, what the decisions would be back in the office. And I really prefer where the client does that, and they lead, and I just consult. Okay. Uh, in this case, it's a kind of, and this one was done with Jerry. I'm sure she pushed in certain areas stronger, and in some cases, the clients won, and they won. They, they found that they had a somewhat of a difficult uh, interrelationship, and I, I don't think Jerry Kavanaugh was really happy with what happened here as much as she was on another job where we were less happy, so, you know, it's that kind of a thing. I don't know if she won as many battles. Um, some of the things she brought in just for these photographs, these were Shulman's photographs uh, that were later were published. Uh, now I'm going to go under the house for a moment just to show you what happened by lifting it off the site. Part of lifting it off was to also allow, they wanted places for the kids to play on the site, and uh, although they had the park next door, uh, the feeling was by lifting the house off, it also returned the ground for total use. Uh, it gave them potential expansion if they ever wanted to expand at a later, later time. And uh, as I said before, it solved some of the foundation problems in a better, better kind of a way. Uh, you can see the kinds of things that go on under there. And it's quite a nice play space. Uh, the owner built the play equipment himself and kind of interrelated it back to what uh, some of the, the thoughts that were in the structure. I mean, he, he was trying to be sensitive to some of the things that, that I had done, and, and it was kind of nice. And, and this whole area then becomes another area completely. In fact, for a while, I thought they ought to, if they didn't use it for their own need, I thought they ought to, they, uh, this is back in the days when communes again were <laughs> great to, to rent out each one of the towers as a kind of a communal thing. <laughs> uh, but it, but it did give them storage units. It gave them places to, for the little kids to hide under. And I, it's probably turned, I've never really studied it as, a, as with the, watching the kids, the kind of thing probably you would do, Terry, but, uh, you know, to see just how it had, has worked for them. I'm sure they, they spent a lot of time at the park, as I would have expected them to do. But when they were smaller, I'm sure they, stay, they spend a lot of time under the house. In this one, now, uh, we did get the growth back. And uh, uh, it, I don't know why. It doesn't receive that much more light than mine, but for some reason, either the soil condition or, or what goes on under there seems to stay fairly green and more pleasant. Then this is the stairway back up to the deck that goes back into the house that's at the center point. OK. Another one. Uh, can you focus that one, please, sir? This was really a, a, an early prototype, and 
I've shown this one before, but this was one of the smallest houses in this system and much a little closer to the original idea. It was designed again about 10 years, eight, 10 years ago. Uh, it's just being built still by the owner almost by hand in, in Santa Barbara and it goes up kind of piece by piece and it's kind of a fun process. But again, this has the concrete tower and it has a slip in, it could have a slip in system. Here's the way it, it was modeled. Uh, And this is then showing it in, in construction. And you can see that actually, in this case, he purchased a, a uh, I guess it was a piece, I don't know whether it was part of a religious retreat that they were tearing down. And he purchased all the lamb beams and all the, uh, the joists that he cut in, that he cut in half and made all the laminated floors and roofs out of for about $1,200. And then uh, this, after, when he was able to purchase that, I, I adjusted. Uh, the whole project to the sizes of the members that he was able to purchase and uh, we then went back and, and so we reworked the scheme somewhat and we again had the flexibility to go back through that process. He had a, he has a site in Montecito overlooking uh, the Channel Islands and it's kind of a neat little site. It's a small little house but it's kind of a nice uh, thing and, and the process by which it's being built is terrific. You know, he poured all his own concrete, he's placed all his own laminated beams, he's I mean, he's he's, he's a, just a great guy, and uh, it's getting it's it's almost closed in now. These were early early shots. These are early. I mean, after he worked for a couple of years, it, he didn't start building it for several years after it was designed. Either. But it's a it's a fairly pure system of lamb beams, concrete, uh, bearing wall system, and and laminated floors. Where is that That's in Santa Barbara, Montecito. Okay, and now the other extreme, uh, which is uh, the Sultan House, which is, is the first the house you just saw was 2,000 feet. This now is 6,000 feet. Similar system. Can we focus that one again? It's, it's sort of out, too. I don't know why these don't, that, I should have put the, that one on the, on our good projector, because it seems like that one's always running out of focus. And again, another, way that these things could be slipped in. Now this, this one grew in various ways. And the one thing that I've enjoyed out of the whole system is that as many changes that took place on this one as it was in construction and going up and changing around back and forth and what have you, uh, the system seemed to hold it, still be able to hold somewhat together, a certain amount of fragmentation going on, but still it could expand and it could slip in. And by holding the services pretty much in, in cores, uh, the rooms could move out or move in, move around, uh, and we were able to make a lot of adjustments on this and, and in the support system as it went on. And so, uh, again, it's a fairly complex system. I don't know if it's, well, the, again, kitchen, you can see where that is, living room, dining room, and, and guest room to the left, family room, interlink. There's a bridge across this thing, and you go upstairs, there's a master bedroom, there's some kids' rooms. It kind of goes on and on. Some of you have been out there, you wonder what's, go what's happening. I've, uh, I never heard anybody say, gee, it's a great house. They always say, geez, what is it, or what's going on, or I, I don't understand it, or it's crazy, or it's this or that, and I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't even know how to even view it myself anymore, so. Uh, in the early stages, again, it was the same. It was a wood system, very much like the Gertler house. Uh, we use a craning system always to take the laminated beams into position. Uh, again, I wish I could do enough of these to use really the slip-in system. This was a later shot of it, not just about a week or so. I, they're, they're now trying to finish it up by December 4th so they can sell it. Uh, <laughs> and, and after you go through this kind of a process and you spend uh, several years or with a client and they spend that much time with you and you've, you've gone through the cabinetry six times or it feels like six times and you've, you've done it once, one of, your, one of the people, the designer draftsman working for you has done it once and then they get a cabinet man who does it again and then rooms are being extended and enlarged and changed and all these kinds of things and then after all of that they, they, it's too big for them and they don't want, don't want it anymore. 
and then they go, go about selling it, you start to wonder why spend that kind of time with clients. I mean, it really gets discouraging because you, you put in the hours. And it, and it could have been done without a client in a very simple way. We could have, you know, they could have given me the plan, gone away for two years, it would have probably turned out about the same, and the, the client hours would have been about one one hundredth of what they were. But anyway, that's a lot of that was done on the job. Okay, let's then moving on to the, another one, similar system, different scheme, slightly different. Okay, uh, constantly these are I'm dealing usually with either sim similar systems or construction schemes. This is the Katzenstein house, and a lot of you have probably visited it, and so I hope you can understand it as you, as you see the plan scheme. What we did differently here was that on some of the wood systems, when we would get into carrying the, the beam members, uh, we were, our connections at the column points became uh, rather difficult. And so in this one, uh, the decision was made to really let the, the, the columns do, it was really going back really to a post and beam system with really the unit becoming more of a shear element rather than the carrying element totally. And uh, this was really for ease of construction uh, in, in this particular case. And so we, th we wanted to see how much easier it might be if we do it this way and how our connections would be different. So again, ground floor, this is the carport to the front, studio workshop at the ground level, unusable space uh, to the left, uh, first floor. Again, here the kitchen and the, and the living room were, were, want, were meant to be equal. The owner wanted uh, the kitchen to be as important as the uh, living room. Uh, the dining room then is the intermediate link. Uh, it was developed in a way where the, the, the kids' rooms then related over the kitchen in a two-story element, the master bedroom related over the living room, and then there's this little bridging across that uh, is sort of a guest bridge or kind of a little den platform element. Again, the bathrooms are always in, in the cores and the somewhat similar system. Okay, this again, you know, architects always like to talk about these kinds of things because this is the con this is the part of the building that went up in one day, you know. Then the rest, <laughs> then from that time on, of course, there's uh, there's there's another ten months to a year or better that go by while all the infill is going on. But say again, if you could use these systems where you could prefab or, or deal with the unit off the site and flow it in, and probably you could cut down the processes by a great amount. And actually, some of the construction techniques and costs and economics of them would be diminished and, and be a lot more competitive. The problem that we always have is we're always dealing with prototypes. And that's one of the sad things. And I think Adi has made statements like that, that the, the poor architect is always doing the, the big mock-up prototype for the first time and that's sort of about as many times as you get to do it. Now, of course, I've, through a process, tried to explore the, the system, hoping some, at one time, someday, to be able to plug the other thing in. But by this time, I've almost lost interest in doing it anymore. But it was, it was running through this process. Anyway, this is the frame as it went up. This is the finished uh, house, which still exposes the whole frame totally. You, you understand pretty well the construction technique of the whole house. It's quite understandable, yet it, it also, I don't think, loses uh, the kinds of perceptual elements and the kinds of experiential elements that uh, I think a piece of architecture should have. Okay, now a different system that was being done during this such same period. Again, a house with a soil condition. This time we just went to straight pilings, and uh, I used a straight pile system on this one, uh, and that, that's about it. All the seismic is taken out in the vertical column, and uh, that's the house in its location. Similar lamb beam system, but it's only to a single column system, and it doesn't separate out the service areas from the, 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 uh, the other parts of the, the structure. So it has some elements in common, but it has uh, a certain number of dissimilarities. They were meant to be concrete. They were later, they had to be, for economy, they, were, they had to go to block. Uh, they, were, they were. OK, then this is one down at the beach. and. I, do I have this? Okay. 
Here, I'll, this is another construction technique that we used uh, uh, down there. This, this one, all of these frames that you see on, the, on this right hand, or your right hand slide, right, uh, were fabricated on the ground and then vertically craned up and then the floors slipped in between. And this is the way we, we projected the, the way it would be built. Usually these things don't happen. Uh, normally what happens is that you get a contractor who says, well, that's a stupid way to build a building. And then they, they go about building it in the conventional way and it becomes much more difficult. In this case, we had a carpenter who really dug the idea and uh, did all his measurements and, and all the fabrication uh, on the ground. And this thing went up in, in this manner. And it was, it was kind of a nice to have it followed through as we had hoped it would be. OK, and that was when all the frames were in place. And they were designed as they were with the corner leg turned out so that uh, they could stand by themselves without a lot of uh, support system uh, when, when they were put into the vertical, vertical position. OK, then all the rest of the infill took place uh, in, this in, in this framework. And so you can see what, what happens at that point. Here again, it's somewhat di not as typical beach kind of a house. It, uh, first of all, he wanted the greatest amount of span and in that glass. He wanted to have as much opening to the sea as he could get. And uh, <clears throat> what I did is I concentrated all the pilings to the corners. So we, the, the piling conditions, again, are just there's several pilings driven in one point rather than spread all over the site. And then we took a, we capped them off with a concrete cap and pull the, the laminated beam over the top of it in order to sit the house, the, the house down closer to the sand. And <clears throat> here, usually, you have to get up in the air to get your sanitation devices. So at the middle point, we pulled up that part of the house and, and got our sanitation under there and took the front end much closer to the beach itself. So it, it, it married tighter to the beach. bottom floor is identical to the upper floor. This is the, this is the living room, which is, goes the full, I think, 40 or 50 feet in one large open space. You go upstairs to the bedroom, it's the same thing. It was, again, the whole 40, 50 feet. And it's <laughs> he was kind of an interesting client. His, his whole, everything he did was the same way. His office was always one huge space. It would be like about this whole room. Uh, he always dealt in large, large spaces. Uh, and he lived in that same fashion. Uh, okay, I think we're into the next tray, Jerry, and that's on the last one. Well, I'll go back until I get some. Am I going as late as Terry went last week? <laughs> no, 10 o'clock. OK, good. We can get, we'll, we'll finish by maybe 10.30. What's going on? We're not on. Little light show in between. Oh, that's, that tray, I think, it, did it slip on its bottom part? Maybe you're in luck, we jammed a tray. OK, while we're at the beach, I, I'll, I'll deal with another building type. It's a, it's a condominium at the beach, or as the, I guess the owners like to call them, three houses with common walls. Uh, which is nice. I, I, you know, there used to be a time when you did a condominium that a person would refer to it as a, 
a unit or it's too bad it isn't a house. But when you get up into the price ranges that these things get into after a while, uh, they're, they're damn well houses and uh, in, the, in the owner's mind. And the common wall no longer seems to bother them. And it's nice that it doesn't because of it, 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 it for economic reasons, it's, uh, we're able to get them down more. Okay, the challenge on this kind of a, a site that we've talked about before is how do you get the most kind of space uh, from front to back through the house and vertically without getting into and the challenge I usually I would give myself here is with one one set of stairs. So the category has to fall into a two-story house at the same time as you're trying to develop like four stories of space. And uh, by working the codes in special ways, uh, you can do this. And most many architects today deal in these kinds of issues. So the garage is to the left side low. Uh, there's sort of a family open space on the first floor, kitchen level, back to the two-story living room. Uh, a loft space, a master bedroom, on up to the roof deck and out to the, the ocean. Uh, plan form is like so. It's 18 feet foot on center. It's spanned between walls. Uh, it used the same separated system that was described to you last week uh, of two separate walls for better insulating purposes, and it works fine that way. This is the ground floor level that I explain, expressed with the Carports, the family area, the, uh, the beach level. Uh, the, the one on the left was, by the owner, uh, was the one occupied by the owner of the condominium, so it was larger than the other two and had a, an extra yard. The other two were sold. Nothing extra special in the structural process is fairly straightforward other than the left, hand, left upper hand corner, which in order to open up the glass corner, we, we changed the framing system at that point, which you'll see later with with a couple of iron beams. Upper floor, there's the open kind of thing. Just, I'll run through that. Okay, the, the alley side, the beach side, the internal parts, and I'll kind of take you up through the stairway. Then looking down back into living space. loft to the bedroom. One of the things that I really try to do here was we have, a, we have a small deck off the master bedroom. There's an ability to see through to the ocean through, through the other way that I, if I come back one. From this point, if, you, if you're in bed there looking out through uh, the stair unit, you're able to still get contact with the ocean. So you have it from the speedway side to the ocean and mo almost every room has contact through. And that was true in any of the plans. I, I didn't go through the plan schemes, but uh, in some cases they turned one space into two bedrooms. In another case it was a service room. In another case it was a master bedroom. So there was flexibility within what could be done in, in, the, in the floor spaces. This is up the stairs and down the bridge and the viewing thing to the ocean. Uh, back to the front side again from that, that viewing point, um, back on beach side. And always a shot with the sun in the glass. Okay, now, now I'm going to go through two that change system, and that'll be, that'll be it for this series. And this is, as I said, this, this describes really about a 8 to 10 year period, uh, 12 years in terms of thought process, eight or 10 years in execution while uh, I've been involved with other kinds of things that I showed you earlier with the office itself. But these were still kind of private houses that I, I kept handling along the way. And again, I, when I talked to them, I only no, no job unless you do it all yourself from design through working drawings, through construction, through every portion of supervision is strictly an I job. There are always people in your firm that are, if you have one draftsman or if you have one design associate, if you have, uh, people working with you, it's, you, there's still that combination of ideas that take place. Uh, most of these were conceptually mine. Most of these were carried through 
uh, to a great degree by, my, by, by myself, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention Claudio Boccato, an associate who's been with me for seven or eight years, who's worked very closely on all of these and followed through various processes with me. Uh, Bill Simonian, who was working in the office at one time uh, on part of these, who we were doing some of the working drawings, because there's, there's detailing that has to take place, the decisions that go on in certain parts take place that way. Bruce Levin, another person in the office who was working on this one at that time uh, with me. And so, but I feel there's still fairly personalized kinds of attitudes and ideas. This, this one is, again, another simple <coughs> idea. It, it's based on, a, on the very simplest of schemes, which is really the square. And you heard Steve talk to it last week in what would call, be called basic design uh, mutations of certain types where there were revolutions, there were you know, all the terminology he used last week. And then, of course, on these, I have a series of squares used in this way. You'll see another one where they come together in a different way. And again, the, the reason for using the square was really to see what could be done with a repetitive type system. And could you get the spaces out of it, even though you repeated the, the single element? And can that still give you that diversity that, that people want? Now, this is a combination of the square with additives and plug-ons uh, in concept, site plan concept, really, which is just, you know, five cubes lined up varying various heights. So it isn't a pure cube, but I mean a cubic form extended. Then taking, leaving the, leaving the corners and taking the rest of it out. Then taking it to the next point, because there were many trees surrounding it, of cutting out the corner in order to better express uh, the tree form. Now, this is a kind of design decision that came out of uh, working with someone in the office and discussing it as I was going through it. And one, one guy said, well, you know, gee, you remember, there were some neat tree trunks out there. Do you think if we cut the corners out of it, uh, it would start to, we would have another element of expression? Well, okay, it confused uh, the construction system in a way, but in a sense, at the same time, it added another dimension that was pretty neat. And it was, that was not my idea. It was somebody else's idea, but I liked the idea, and we incorporated it. Uh, you know, I, I was going to go with the clean square corner on it. OK, then <clears throat> the way it breaks down in plan and its support system is what you see in red. And then the linkages, all the bridges, you'll see better in another diagram that I have here. So now you see the, the, the square points, all the, the kind of pinkish color or the rosy pink color is, those are all the plug-ons again. They again are the service elements in most cases. Uh, the, the other sort of lavender color would be storage units that would be set in and all the orange are the linkages, the, the gallery ways, uh, the walkways and the service linkage that goes on in the other. So diagrammatically that's all this thing is about. Uh, five five square forms, uh, and then the linkage is on. OK, then you say, well, does the plan form work? Can it respond to the client? Are you shoving them into a, a fixed uh, square form that how can it solve all these problems uh, well? Well, in this case, it, 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 I think it did it in every single case, except I felt the, the kids' bedrooms were a little small. The client really wasn't bothered by that. So in most cases, it solved the problems. The upper left-hand corner is the carport, the service link directly to the kitchen, which is in one of the plug-ons, or the plug-on idea. These, now, when I'm talking about that, these, again, are attitudes, not realities, uh, <clears throat> which then links to the family room, which crosses over to the dining room. Now, originally, where the dining room is was actually a covered outside area. But by the time we did that, the owner felt, well, why don't we just close it in? So it's a little odd from the kitchen to the dining room to cross over, but the major part of the family dining is in the family room in the dining area. And this way it would be used probably just for company. And she didn't mind the idea of crossing through that. So then the dining room is related back to the living room, past a bar linkage on this lower left-hand corner. We come up a series of stairs to the kids' rooms, which are composed of a playroom and two kids' areas up the flight of stairs to the upper floor, which is the master bedroom, and a little study overlooking the living room. So again, we get the, 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 the adult privacy areas interlinked 
the kids area by itself, but yet somewhat interlinked to the master bedroom, and then these kinds of linkages out to the, to the roof as well. Now, it's a very tight site, as you notice on the site plan, and the attempt here was to, to stack it up and move it up on the site and leave still a, the voided space on the upper right-hand corner is for, was set up for future pool uh, space or it could be a future linkage if one wanted to do it that way. Okay, so this is it in its uh, exonometric form, which shows you all of the uh, plug-ons, the parts, the pieces, the elements. Okay, then we can talk, this is another one of these that we developed a construction system that would work uh, Using that same square form now, we were able to develop a jig uh, on the site, and uh, the builder here, one guy working alone, uh, built all of the <clears throat> all the panels and all the beam systems, and had it all laid out and stacked like you see on the on the this right hand slide. Then uh, he also had all his joist hangers in place and, and everything else, and craned it all up into place again in, in one day after he had it set up. And then the, the, the good part about it, he could use, he brought his table saw out so he could get better accuracy and he had better control. And again, it's sort of a, it's, it's, it's the idea again of using uh, processes that could just as well be done one of two places, in the factory or on the site, and then using uh, cranes or other systems to move these things into place so that once again, one could if they developed a plugging system or a variety of plug-ons, you could develop a system like this, move it up into space, come back in uh, with these plugs, plug-ons that would come to the site and plug those in if you were doing multiple housing. And most of you, if you don't know, it usually takes about a minimum of a thousand houses before you can start to make any of these systems make any sense in, in the true sense. So these are just explorations in the idea. For the, I've said that about a million times. And that's the one carpenter then, once it's lifted into place, making the connections to uh, Bolton in the form. Okay, then the model. And one time we had another plug-on which was eliminated for cost reasons, and that was the sunscreen horizontal element that you see running through the middle to protect uh, the, the rooms from the south sun. And uh, the owner decided they would live without that, and it was eliminated. You can see which areas are skylights and the way it was uh, put together. And then the final product, which a lot of you have seen before and so forth, comes together in this kind of a manner. This is from the master bedroom back out to the roof. And the other thing that we did, which was kind of interesting, is we changed the, the heights through this. Uh, we also solved the problem of moving from the inside to the deck, up the steps, and up to the upper level.